Aaron Lasher, it's a pleasure to have you. You run the blog Real Virtual Currency. Uh, morning, Jeffrey. Thanks for having me on. And tell me about your blog. You started it just a few weeks ago, right? That's correct. I've been a uh, Bitcoin enthusiast and uh, user for about a couple of years now. Um, but I kind of joke that in order to uh, protect my marriage, I decided to <laughs> concentrate my obsessions into a short 30-minute uh, time spent every day to share my thoughts and feelings uh, so my wife doesn't have to hear me uh, prattle on about uh, Bitcoin all day. It, it, it does seem to be a, a kind of feature of people who have used it and are got interested in it that, that they become obsessed. I mean, I'm almost speaking uh, autobiographically here. Yeah, and, and I think that that's a, that's a valid point. I've noticed the same, uh, the same paradigm. And what I would add to that is uh, this includes people who aren't even prone to obsessions in the first place. So myself, I've never, I've never <laughs> found myself so compelled to write uh, so prolifically. In fact, usually I find it a chore. So uh, it's worth noting that a lot of people just uh, have been sort of swept up in the, uh, the, the Bitcoin uh, storm. Yeah, and, and it's not just about, about the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Bitcoin as a speculative uh, investment, right? I mean, it's about its, its prospects as, as, a, as an actual money that's so intriguing. Absolutely. The speculative component is, is a very important one and one that I believe people uh, tend to focus on for good reason. Uh, and it shouldn't be ignored. But uh, underlying any speculation uh, is a fundamental reason for uh, a value or a potential value increase. And uh, I think that the most exciting part of Bitcoin is the sort of suite of, uh, of uh, properties that it has that makes it a contender for a uh, competitive currency. On the phone the other day, you listed... I want to get to the security thing, and that's the main thing I want to focus on because you seem to be a real, real expert in that area. But uh, you listed a number of properties that money has that you think uh, Bitcoin has also, and uh, possible advantages that Bitcoin has over other forms of money. Certainly. So depending on your school of monetary thought, you will include a different basket of properties to qualify a particular uh, financial uh, uh, category as a currency. Uh, there, are, there are some uh, categories, there are some, some properties that are generally well accepted. Uh, currencies should be fungible, they should be easily recognizable, they should be difficult to counterfeit, uh, they should be portable, and so forth. Uh, depending on whose list you look at, you could probably come up with, with maybe uh, 10 things. Um, I think the thing that makes Bitcoin so exciting is that it it attempts to mimic gold. So there, there is a, um, I'm not going to call it an overriding uh, political or economic statement, but there is intrinsic to the Bitcoin protocol uh, a, a bet, if you will, that sound money, uh, or rather money that can't be inflated arbitrarily, is actually superior uh, to fiat currencies that can. In addition to gold, Bitcoin has a couple of properties that make it, uh, in my opinion, a, a, a step up. Um, cream of the crop in that uh, not only is it fungible, divisible, easily recognizable, can't be counterfeited and so forth, it's also, it's also capable of being transmitted near instantaneously, globally, and, and completely securely uh, acro across the world. So, so that particular uh, property is one that it's difficult to have, it's difficult to find, similar to an email, um, except that you can't take it back, uh, you can't resend that email. Uh, and it makes it it makes it a very uh, unique in that way. So it's quite new. Um, so you said also uh, something that intrigued me that that uh, Bitcoin is the first money that doubles as a payment system, which I guess is a shorthand way of saying what you just said. That's correct. It's difficult to uh, wrap your head around Bitcoin. Some of my uh, contemporaries have said that if you're going to learn about it, you need to sit down for at least half a day. Uh, you can't ride in an elevator and have someone tell you what it is and, and sort of soak it in all at once. One of the reasons for that is that it is more than a currency or a potential currency. It is also a payment system. So that's, you know, to give you an analogy, that would be like combining uh, the U.S. dollar with Visa uh, without having any particular entity running either. Um, now, that analogy might be misleading because Bitcoin isn't, after all, a, a single enterprise or a, a single product offered by some 
some uh, single corporation. Bitcoin is an open source piece of software. It's, it's actually uh, devilishly simplistic in that it's something that anyone can download and run on their computer. Um, we're not used to thinking about peer-to-peer uh, -peer software and open source software in an everyday context. But yes, because of the way it, it works, it actually uh, it, it decentralizes the authority of the currency uh, away from uh, from a, a sort of cabal of, of individuals and rather uh, relies on the consensus of everyone to use a certain algorithm and protocol that uh, restricts the rate of, of new Bitcoin increases. So here we have another layer of implausibility to it. I mean, there's plenty of people that can't imagine how anything open source can work in the first place. Yes, and, and for that we do have examples of many open source things that uh, that have worked. They're very much like weeds. <laughs> so if you've uh, thought of um, some, uh, the best example is probably file sharing uh, pieces of software like uh, BitTorrent or uh, I actually don't know that many of them because I, uh, it's been a while since I was young enough to, uh, to dabble in that kind of, that kind of stuff. But um, they're difficult to uh, get rid of because there's no central server, there's no central uh, person who, who owns it and runs it, and uh, if you wanted to extinguish it, you'd have to wipe it off of every single computer on which it resides, and that, that's implausible, that's, that's impractical. Now, what about uh, the claim that it is only a payment system, and, uh, and that its monetary properties are unachievable? That's a debate worth having. I think today that that debate would be won by an individual making that claim if you were to take a snapshot of the currency, snapshot of the currency today. Uh, reason being, it's high volatility. So uh, people who have been involved in a long time, people who have studied Bitcoin, all agree that the volatility will decrease over time uh, as adoption rates plateau, where, wherever they may plateau, whether it's you know where we are now or with another 100 million people or a billion people. Uh, and so volatility will uh, decrease, at which point it will be a better currency than it is today. So no argument there. If you're going to use it as if you would dollars today, you would, you would do so at great risk. Uh, to your purchasing power, uh, but luckily there are financial inter intermediaries that allow you to, to buy and sell Bitcoin uh, while simultaneously uh, transacting in dollars. So you can go to a merchant, you can pay them uh, a Bitcoin or $120 for something, and uh, going through a company such as uh, BitPay uh, allows you to, to actually uh, hand them $120 uh, in reality. Can you list any advantages that come from holding and using Bitcoin and not uh, converting to dollars uh, that it might have over just kind of keeping this constant conversion stuff going? Yes, so this is this is somewhat of a philosophical question and it, it's difficult to answer and will I guess time will tell. Um, there is a, uh, there's a there's a difference in opinion I would say among Bitcoin users. Uh, one group thinks that uh, it's important to spend bitcoins in the Bitcoin economy to, to kind of spread them out, spread the word, uh, and uh, get people to to use them. And, and it's, this is this is sort of the objective: is to, to spend them. Um, the other group says you don't have to focus so much on spending. Um, for now, you can just hold them and work on building other uh, infrastructure around the, this blooming Bitcoin economy. Um, I I kind of fall somewhere in the middle. I think that it is. It is always great when two people decide to transact in Bitcoin and not uh, reconvert those into U.S. dollars. The problem is I would advise merchants against doing that today, specifically because you might, you might uh, think this technology is great, but if you haven't considered the risks, you could accept a Bitcoin that tomorrow is worth, is worth half as much. You said something interesting to me uh, when we were talking about this before, that you think that when, when people first get into Bitcoin, it's good to sort of step in. Uh, just a little bit at a time to so you can get a feel for it. The reason for that is because it uh, requires a lot of personal discipline on behalf of managing your coins. So suddenly we've gone from a situation where you're used to dealing with uh, banks or insurance companies and if you lose your credit card or if you lose your paperwork you can call them up and say hi I'm Jeffrey Tucker uh, here's my social security number if you need it. I lost my password, and they can they can get everything back for you. Bitcoin is very much like cash, but it's it's a very it's a very tricky kind of cash that uh, 
you can lose if you don't store it properly. There is a trade-off between the risk that you're going to lose your coins because you've only stored them in one place and then you wipe your hard drive clean or your computer crashes and gets stolen, and the risk that um, you're actually going to have your, your coins maliciously stolen and targeted because you've made hundreds of copies and they're lying around all over your house and it was easy for someone to just, just pick it up and take it. So every individual, I think, uh, has a profile for what kind of protection and, and uh, security that they need. And that choice is something that you shouldn't take lightly and you shouldn't make in one day. So to answer your question, absolutely recommend that people should read about Bitcoin before they buy any or trade any. And they should, in, the, in their first uh, transaction, only, only take on a couple coins so that they don't, uh, they don't uh, learn a lesson that's too expensive. So just to be clear, the, the risk of having your hard drive crash and losing your Bitcoins is, is a risk that's only associated if you download the official Bitcoin client, right, and run it on your uh, local machine. But if you're using a, a web-based uh, client uh, wallet service and your hard drive crashes, it makes no difference, right? You can still log in and, and have access to your money. That, that's exactly correct, Jeffrey. So an analogy that I like to use for how the Bitcoin protocol works is uh, there are basically three things. There's a big book. Uh, there are pens that can write in this book. And then there are ink cartridges that can go in that pen. So the book is this sort of magical giant ledger that it has a history of every single Bitcoin and its providence since the beginning of time. And uh, that's how we verify that a coin is actually a coin and not some... Uh, uh, some counterfeited coin. Um, the pens that write in this book are pieces of software called clients. And you stated correctly, you can have them on your desktop, for instance, um, or you can trust a third party and host it on a web service. I know that you, for instance, use blockchain.info. They have a very good reputation because of the software they use. They actually don't personally have access to your coins. They use your information uh, to to derive your Bitcoin addresses. It's a, it's a client-facing um, Bitcoin wallet. So so there are different types of pens, and, and everyone should choose a pen that, that suits them, or maybe multiple pens, depending on how much how much money you have in a particular wallet. And then there are the ink cartridges, which are sort of your uh, your addresses and private keys, and you can load them into pens, and you can uh, you can make transactions on the blockchain, and uh, those as well can be protected in different ways. You know what I find a little bit mind boggling, but I've as I reflect back on my own experience. When I first started getting into this, you know, you you enter into a world of these, you know, 30, 40 digit, you know, random numbers, right? Uh, I mean, you've got your your wallet identifier, which is your login. You've got your public key. You've got your private key. You've got your Bitcoin addresses for other people. You've got your own Bitcoin address. I mean, how are people going to keep all this stuff straight? I mean, it took me weeks to kind of sort through all this because to the naked eye, they all just look like gibberish. The user interface today is very poor, and with time, we should see layers built up upon the Bitcoin uh, protocol that uh, remove the need of any individual to deal with these numbers whatsoever. Well, that's interesting. So, um, like in the early days of email, everybody's addresses were, were long, complicated numbers. Yeah, mine was 106315,530 at CompuServe.com. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, imagine, imagine giving that out to somebody and... So here's my personalized email address. Yeah, yeah. How have changed. And yeah. it's actually funny you should mention that. I, I, I'm involved in a, a venture right now. Um, it's uh, very exciting. I'll, I'll tell you offline. I don't I don't want to take away from the big that, Okay, that's fine. Uh, tell me a little bit. Now, this is kind of going out into the edgier areas, but um, tell me about some of the uh, security solutions you were you were talking to me about. I mean, there there is this, this problem. If you're running the desktop client, which... I don't expect any normal person's actually going to be doing, um, you know, downloading the official software and running the blockchain on your hard drive. Um, but uh, if you're doing that, there is a risk of losing your coins. And you also mentioned to me that, you know, very few savvy Bitcoin users today who at some point didn't face some problem in making some user error that led them to, to miss, miss un missing coins. This is a, a problem, but... You, you talked about various solutions from cold storage to uh, what, what, what you called a brain wallet, I think. Yeah, these are some of the most exciting solutions that I've ever seen. Um, and I, I would agree with you that a lot of uh, 
old Bitcoin users have gone through sort of a rite of passage in which they've lost a certain number of coins due to user error or bad luck. I think you yourself mentioned a bad <laughs> bad luck story. It's true. Which I, I send my condolences. <laughs> I, I, I've also undergone <laughs> this process, and it's a it's a sobering and, uh, and disappointing thing to, to have happen. But if you're lucky, you don't lose all your coins, and you can kind of carry on and, and pick up where you left off. Um, so I, I'm going to describe the concept of a paper wallet and a brain wallet, and I'll try to do so as, uh, as clearly as possible. Think of, uh, think of your Bitcoins as in a very, very tiny safe, the size of a, of a molecule, like a hydrogen molecule. And uh, you have a string of numbers that tells you its coordinates in space. So the only, the only thing that allows you to find that, that little safe is you know where it is, and no one else knows where it is, and they could look for an eternity and they'd never find it because it's so small and it's so remote. So you have this, this roadmap, basically, to find this little safe. And if anyone has that information, they can find your safe and they can open it up and they can take out your coins. So this is the thing that must be protected uh, with, 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 the most, with the most care, and it's just like a house key. So uh, you can make copies of your house key, right? You can take a house key, you can copy it 10 times, give it out to all your family, all your friends, um, and if anyone has that key, they can open your door, and they can go inside, and they can take your television. But there are other ways of storing a key. You might uh, put that key on a piece of paper and draw an outline of the key, just the shape, right? So now conceivably, you could take that to a locksmith and say, hey, can you make me a key that looks like this? And with any luck, you'd be able to. So what you've just done is made a paper wallet of your key. Yeah. So if you don't want to store your actual, an actual physical key, you can, you can make a paper copy of the information to make that key in the first place, and you can stick that in your safe. And you can take that information and you can encrypt it. You can take a password and you can, you can sort of overlay that to make sure that no one can see that picture. So it looks like gobbledygook. So what I'm trying to describe is... Um, that you have you have this thing that has a key to it and you can you can store the information of that key in all sorts of different ways the brain wallet is a way in which you actually store the information to make your private key in your head and luckily some uh, there are some nice algorithms that help us to do this where you can actually memorize a string of words so let's say I memorize um, a phrase it's just 10 random words in a row you know bottle chair dog walk happiness what have you something that would be really hard for someone to guess you run this through a standard algorithm and it will it can make you a unique bitcoin address with a unique private key so what you've just done is enabled yourself to memorize the coordinates or at least a way to derive the coordinates of that little sort of atomically small safe in the middle of space and, and uh, if you make a wallet this way, it does require a little bit of uh, research and tech savvy, but I assure you it, it's not something that um, is particularly difficult or above the average person. If you make a wallet out of a brain wallet, um, and keep in mind you can have paper copies of this wallet as well, you can have digital copies, but let's say you're extradited to Siberia and someone smashes all your computers and, and you have nothing. With what you've memorized in your head, you can go to a computer and you can rederive your, your private key and your addresses, and then you can get your coins again. So, so these brain wallets are kind of freaky sci-fi stuff. I admit that, but I assure you they're very real. And I keep ninety percent of my coins in uh, what are called cold wallets, meaning you know they're not loaded into any ink. The ink cartridges are not loaded into any pens, whether on my computer or in the cloud. And uh, there, there are multiple copies of these cold storage wallets, but every single one of them is derived from a brain wallet, so if I have my entire, you know, corporeal life uh, stricken from me, then I, I can uh, I can re-derive them and find my coins. Now, it's possible to actually uh, print out, I mean, back to the more mundane stuff, to print out uh, paper copies of uh, certain Bitcoin amounts, right? I remember when I first got interested in Bitcoin, I went to a website that allows you to um, to print out, you know, a QR code that you could hand to a waitress, for example, at the restaurant. Yeah. Absolutely, that's that's a great example. So what you've just done is um, you've you've made a house, you built a house, you threw a Bitcoin inside, and then you made uh, one copy of the key, and you outlined it on a piece of paper. And now you have your paper wallet. Yeah. And you may have a copy of that 
of that key yourself, or you may not. It may be the only existing copy in the world, or you might you might have some backups in case this person loses their their, uh, their Bitcoin. But what you do when you give them that piece of paper, um, provided that they they learn about how to how to uh, make it you know put it to any use, um, is you've given them a paper wallet that has uh, it gives them access to a uh, to a vault with one Bitcoin inside of it. Right, or or whatever amount you choose. Or whatever amount you choose, two bitcoins. To, I mean, a thousand bitcoins if you're lucky. <laughs> yeah, so so you can put a point zero, you know, point zero one bitcoin on a piece of paper and hand it hand it to anybody, and they can they can go back or just open up their smartphone, scan it, and it transfers the money, right? Precisely. So you also mentioned a solution to these uh, really long numbers. You're correct in that they can be represented in a QR code that you can scan with the phone. So you don't need to sit there and sort of type out this really long uh, 30 digit number with uppercase letters, lowercase letters, and numbers. Um, but you, you mentioned a great thing that uh, I think a lot of uh, Bitcoin users are doing, which is uh, eating, dining out, uh, giving a, a, a regular tip, but on top of that, leaving a little, a little paper wallet of Bitcoin, explaining what it is, and you know, just kind of spreading the, uh, spreading the love. Um, but people who do that make a copy of the original uh, key in case that uh, waitress or waiter loses it, it doesn't care about it, so they kind of give them a 30-day period to take the coin, and if they don't, they'll just move it out. Just but take it back, yeah. I highly encourage uh, for, for people to do, and uh, if anyone gives you a Bitcoin, I encourage you to hang on to it. I think I told you, Jeffrey, on the phone, um, when my friend got married, I sent him 10 Bitcoins when the price was $10, and now his uh, $100 wedding gift has become, I suppose, as of today, a $1,200 wedding gift. So he's pretty happy with that. Yeah. Um, I was just reading this morning, because I'm trying to catch up. You've been involved in this, in, this, in this sector a very long time, and I'm just now kind of catching up on the ethos and the big moments and the miles, milestones and stuff like that in the past. But there was a moment, apparently, in February of 2011, where Bitcoin achieved uh, what people call dollar parity. Do you remember that? I, that was actually before before I was introduced to Bitcoin, okay. um, but I, I certainly read the, uh, <laughs> the the sailor tales, if you will, of the uh, of the time, um, and you know it actually inspired me to write the article I'm going to post today on my blog, um, which is counter. It's a counter argument to the uh, the claim that Bitcoin will die because people will will hoard it, and uh, and they'll just sort of gather it all up and then it won't be. Uh, disseminated properly, for lack right. of a better word. Um, but what you find is, the longer you've been in Bitcoin, the more Bitcoins you've had, and and it's very likely that you don't have them today. So a lot of people, when the Bitcoin hit dollar parity, um, went bonkers and you know sold a bunch of Bitcoins. And uh, I mean, I, there's, there's one guy over in London. I I'm not I'm not a uh, I'm not an enormous fan of his media appearances, but his name's Amir Taki. I have to give him credit. Uh, for at least being an early adopter, um, but he, uh, you know, he had thousands and thousands of bitcoins, and uh, he he sold them for a profit of a hundred dollars or a hundred pounds, and thought you know thought that was the best thing since sliced bread. If he'd hung on to them, he'd have you know probably close to a million uh, million pounds today. So um, this this continues. I mean, we we're very short sighted. So think about it. Um, the same process continues right right under our noses. Right. Um, where you think $120, that's so high, this is crazy, everyone's hoarding, um, it's going to kill the currency. But to the contrary, what you have are, are now a group of people who bought at uh, you know, 30 or 40 or 50, and they've doubled or tripled their money. And if we're talking from a purely speculative standpoint, which I'm happy to do, again, I, I don't like to focus on it, but it is, it is important, um, then you're, you're going to have some itchy fingers saying, well, I, maybe I should sell some of these. Well, there was even a little bit of that this weekend because I think Mt. Gox got hit with another DDoS attack uh, 24 hours ago or something like that, and there's a there's a you know a, a minor sell off, and then they came back up and then the price recovered. I you know this shift might have been only five or ten dollars, and it may or may not have been related to to the DDoS. Um, but were you aware of that taking place? Yes, so DDoS attacks have been, uh, they're not new in the Bitcoin world, but they've, they've been particularly uh, frequent in the last three months. Yeah. And, and someone or some group has found, uh, oddly in my opinion, but I, I suppose that I'm, you know, maybe I think differently, um, oddly found success, at least up until recently, in uh, attacking the large exchanges 
with these uh, botnets that overwhelm their servers with uh, useless requests. And uh, what, what it does is it causes a minor panic among Bitcoin, Bitcoin owners who uh, start uh, spamming in sell orders and uh, you know, crashes the price, usually temporarily. So uh, th there was there was a profitable uh, there, were, there was a profitable component to this activity at least until recently, and I say that um, because uh, now you see that DDoS attacks have less and less effect on the community. People have sort of been hardened uh, by the uh, by the histor historical attacks, and they don't they don't panic anymore. Um, but you, you can understand the mechanism, right? You, you'd sell a bunch of coins. Then try to cause a panic, and then buy a bunch when they're cheaper. Rinse, repeat. Yeah, I mean, is there any any evidence that anybody's actually doing that? I ask because DDoS attacks are not exactly uncommon. I mean, anybody who's been an admin of a website has to deal with them. Yeah, so I'm not I'm not an expert on DDoS attacks, but uh, I think that they're particularly nasty uh, ones. I, I I suspect. I, so they're not cheap, by the way. I mean, if you want to cause a DDoS attack, uh, you have to basically buy one and, and uh, kind of slave together all these machines. Yeah. Um, so there is a risk in doing something like this that you'll fail and you'll lose money. Um, but I, I'm not really qualified to answer that question. I do know that there's a lot of uh, uproar in the community um, and, and negativity towards Mt. Gox, the largest exchange, which they've heard loud and clear, and I, I trust that they're working very hard sure. to uh, bolster their, their DDoS defenses. Well, I'm just naturally sympathetic to them because I've been on the other end of that and, you know, been the admin of several websites, everybody's depending on it. It becomes a, it's a problem because the more popular the website becomes, the more vulnerable it is to DDoS, and then you get hit and everybody's screaming at you, listen, you jerk, you know, why, why can't you fix your system, you know, why don't you implement the following you know, protocols that'll protect you against that, and and you're scrambling to try to you know upgrade things and and repair the the, the errors, and you know it's it's like a disaster. I mean, you know, you don't you don't want to live on the uh, you know you don't want your office to be on the twelfth floor, uh, and be an admin of a server that's undergoing a DDoS attack because the window looks very tempting to you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so but but these these things have to happen so that you can discover you know, the failings of your current system. I mean, otherwise, how are you going to improve? I noticed a, a spot of Stockholm Syndrome uh, yesterday on Reddit. Um, someone was posting thanking the DDoS attackers for yeah. uh, stress testing the system. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I mean, the, the, those kind of failings are essential to, to achieving more success. It's very int always, always intriguing to me. Um, people want to bail out of a service when it fails. Uh, in the in the web world, you know, there's there's a DDoS attack, there's a crash, there's you know just something goes wrong, and they say, well, to heck with that service, and they bail, and then the service comes back, and of course, inevitably, not inevitably, but usually, it's better than ever, you know. So to me, uh, you know, when a company undergoes a big failure like that, that's actually you know a good sign that the service is about to improve. It's the last time you want to bail out. I think so. And Mt. Gox cut their teeth. In 2011, on the uh, they had an actual security breach that was that was really bad, and I think that was a huge wake up call for them. So say what you will about Mt. Gox in terms of their ability to deal with DDoS attacks, um, as far as I can tell, their their actual safety, so infil difficulty in which you you find uh, it to uh, infiltrate their actual security systems and, and muck about with people's coins, uh, is very very high. Yeah. Well, I'll let you go for now. I'm sure we're going to have more talks in the future. Um, but you're posting almost daily, you say, on Real Virtual Currency, I think is the name of your blog? That's correct. Uh, it's called Real Virtual Currency. I didn't put a lot of planning into it, so it's, that's not the URL. Uh, the URL is C-H-R-A-L-A-S-H right. or dot .wordpress com. So C-H-R-A-L-A-S-H. Yeah, it's, it's my name, Christopher Aaron Lash. They're just kind of squished together. Well, it's funny because it's obvious that you hadn't really planned for this blog to become famous. But the thing is that when somebody's as knowledgeable and articulate as you, you know, just enters into this community and starts posting really cool stuff that's educational, then suddenly everybody's all over it. You know, so I'm sure you're going to be going through some some revisions, you know, uh, of the presentation and stuff like that in the future, also. You, you flatter Jeffrey, and what are you saying? The design isn't good. <laughs> 
But no, it's it, and it's content that matters more than anything else. I'll just say that. Aaron. <laughs> but thank you for talking to me today, and we'll we'll visit soon. My pleasure, Jeff. Bye bye.